back to the 99 where we are focused on brewing a better competitive commander. I'm your host, Patrick Marlette, here to discuss The Walking Dead. That's right, I'm grasping onto those sweet, sweet monetization dollars as well. Actually, I'm here to voice the opinion of the silent minority in all of this and what has been one of the most toxic weeks for the game in a long time. And that's saying a lot to have so much absurdity centered around a singular product, that product being Watsi's collaboration via Secret Lair with AMC's The Walking Dead. Now, there's been such an outcry against this product. However, I'm going to discuss some of the good surrounding it, and I'm not here to invalidate anyone's feelings or opinions. I just want to offer my reactions, not only to the Rules Committee's decision not to ban the cards, and of course, their thoughts and feelings towards this product as well, as Morrow's opinions on the design of these cards, why they weren't silver bordered, why didn't they do the Godzilla thing, all of that we're going to discuss today, and this is the night before it actually uh, gets spoiled on live television, if I'm not mistaken. AMC's The Talking Dead is going to bring this up, probably in a short five minute second at the beginning or the end of that video. But either way, it's, it's crazy. It's a crazy world. We have legal cards in the world of MTG uh, that are from a different universe. And uh, I guess we're just going to have to be okay with that. But before we jump into this video, I did want to mention the handful of audience members watching now who are the best supporters of this show, and that is our Patreon group. Guys, if you want to help support the channel directly, the best way to do so is via Patreon. Not only do you get special Discord benefits for the channel to talk directly to us, and I offer more than just my opinions on your decks and your thoughts, I try to address every one of you daily. You guys might know this. So if you're not on the Discord and you are a Patreon member, join but also we play pickup games with our Brew Babies and Brew Crew members. So if you want to see a new deck before it's ever featured on the show or just hang out with the crew, that is also the best way to do so. We usually handle voiceover on Discord. And if you are a member of the Brew Crew, well, guess what? You get to take part in our monthly topicals. And the topic of this month is what keyword do you want to return to MTG? and why. And of course, I extend that same question to you, my lovely audience members. What keywords would you like to see return to the world of MTG? Transmute? Transfigure? Banding? <laughs> I'd love to know any and all your thoughts in the comment section down below. And if you didn't catch our last week's video discussing the keywords I would like to see return, I'll encourage you to go check that out as well. But after this video. Now to kickstart this one, we are going to start with the Rules Committee's response to the Walking Dead product, and spoiler alert, they didn't ban it. Uh, they saw no reason to. Now, if you want to read the full responses from the Rules Committee and, of course, Maro's thoughts on the product and the design of it, I will leave links in the description to both of those responses for you. So one is a link to the Rules Committee's website and one is a blog -tog page. It's a Tumblr feed that Maro runs to answer any questions regarding the game. So the issues with the Walking Dead cards, as identified by the Rules Committee, are the availability of these cards is problematic. The existence of non-magic IPs on cards should be discouraged. It's important to note that none of these are considered canonical still. And Negan is a dubious character. That is putting it lightly. Villains, traditionally bad people. Now, why no ban? Why no ban? That is how I've written it on my computer. I'm a five-year-old. And this is a quote from the RC. There's no support in Commander Philosophy document for banning these cards. They certainly present no mechanical difficulties, and taken simply as cards don't come close to fitting any criteria we have for banning. However, as we are always seeking to improve the document, we discussed whether banning these cards could fit under new philosophical criteria, and whether using the ban list in this way was appropriate. And basically, to translate that for you, they're saying the emotional disharmony that this has caused is not reason enough to ban these cards. And I agree with that. I think for the most part, there was no reason to ban these cards. And this is a CDH channel. None of these cards pose a threat in a standard game of CDH, and I don't think it's going to pose a threat in a regular game of Commander either. None of these, really. Uh, but we will discuss the cards at the end of this video as well and go over their effects. Of course, if you want to just see them now, you'll likely be able to find them online and or skip to the end of the video and you can just review them yourself. Uh, but you've likely seen all the spoils. Now, why no availability is the next topic. Why no availability? A concern of many players is that these cards would not be widely available and some countries only available through third party sellers. They worry that this model will be repeated in the future. It will, 
because the cards are mechanically unique, this is the major problem most folks have. A problem we see with adopting a band philosophy based on card availability is explaining it down the road. If a year from now someone stumbles across a copy of one of these cards, tries to use it and discovers that it is banned in Commander, they will ask why. And the explanation is unsatisfactory. People didn't like how they were allocated. One of the calls from the community was that we should ban these cards to send a signal to Wizards of the Coast for a blatantly commercial act. This is the only thing I take issue with in regards to the secret lair drop for The Walking Dead is availability. We'll jump back to this later when we're addressing some of Morrow's remarks on the product, its design, and its allocation. But what they're basically saying is don't be petty. Don't commit us to banning cards because you don't like how they're distributed. And that's fair. That makes total sense in my opinion. Don't be petty. Next up, not my magic, IP in magic. So basically why are we allowing uh, different intellectual properties into the game? So some folks simply don't like the idea of The Walking Dead crossing over into magic, a modern IP breaking an immersion barrier. We understand that feeling. None of us care at all about The Walking Dead. Why is that statement in there? Oh, they're on your team, they're on your team. But also realize that almost everyone has some universe for which they've dreamed of having magic cards. We don't think it's productive to try to gatekeep that. If you dislike it, we support you not playing with the cards. Introduction of a different IP opens Commander to audiences who might not have ever heard of magic or the format. We welcome new friends we haven't met yet. Woo, 100% agree with the RC in regards to intellectual property. Man, right after making that statement that they're on your team, they just shoved their finger right up your butthole. Now, in regards to immersion, I understand that it is everything in magic, but you know what's even more important than immersion? Tolerance. I am disgusted with the amount of people openly stating, I will never play magic with a person who brings these cards to the table, as if this affects Wizards of the Coast in any way. The only thing that attitude is affecting is your relationship to your friends and fellow gamers. That is the only thing that attitude affects. You may not support the IP and or its use in the game. However, that does not give you the right to condemn others that want to support the company that produces this product and or the intellectual property, that being The Walking Dead. And when we get Harry Potter with Strixhaven, I will love it when someone sits down and wants to play Stape with me. If they want to play Harry Potter, Hermione, Ron, maybe not Ron, I wouldn't tolerate that. But every other character from that world, I would love it. RC, totally right on that one. Now, why Negan no ban? Why Negan no ban? Now, this is a controversial character from the show. I, uh, just a disclaimer, I've watched up to season three of The Walking Dead, so I, I don't think Negan ever came up. But it's the dude with the baseball bat and the leather jacket who kills Glenn. We got the pre-bat beaten Glenn, by the way, in the cards. Uh, but I know of Negan. We are sympathetic to this and did give this some consideration to banning just that card. We chose not to because Negan is a villain, plain and simple. No one is suggesting that by putting him on a card, he should be idealized any more so than Nicol Bolas or Yawgmoth. Are those two bad people? I assume as much because the statement was made, but if you watch this show, you know I'm more of a Johnny slash metagamer. I'm not a Vorthos player by any means. I don't really care about the flavor of the cards, nor do I care about the story arcs of the characters that exist in any of the given universes in the world of magic. However, if you are a Vorthos player or you do care about the storylines of the characters in the world of magic, your feelings are perfectly valid. I totally understand. But remember, in works of fiction, sometimes there are bad characters. You can't go around policing media for the rest of the world. It's never going to work out that way. In regards to this product, I mean, doesn't Jeffrey Dean Morgan play Negan from season seven on? Like, is that where he jumps in? Uh, it's to my understanding, he carried that show. So there was no doubt in my mind that they were going to make him one of the playable cards. I mean, that guy is widely popular and I'm not going to condemn anyone for the, any one of the millions of people that enjoyed that show. Uh, the actor who portrayed Negan on the show, uh, anyone that wants to play Negan as a card, I'm not going to do that. That is just not within my right. You can be disgusted by it. You cannot like it. Don't boot them off your table. You just walk away. Okay. If you're an ethical consumer, don't buy the product. Vote with your dollar. That's how you beat this. If enough people agree with you, this product doesn't sell. 
and that would suck for uh, for Mario here. So we're moving on from the RC's response. Again, if you want to read the full response, it is in the link in the description. However, everyone's favorite PR person had a few words in regards to the sets, right? Now, uh, I know of five cards. I think they're stopping at five cards, but I could be dead wrong. But why, why no silver border? Why no silver border is what a lot of people ask. Why are these legal? So silver border means two things. One, it's non-tournament legal, and two, it doesn't do things we can do in black border. At least at the time of printing the cards, magic evolves over time, so silver bordered things can later get promoted into black border. We wanted these cards to be top-down designs of the Walking Dead characters that functioned like more normal black bordered cards. Why aren't these silver bordered? They're legal in eternal formats. They're black bordered because they're legal in eternal formats. It's a no-brainer. They wanted Commander, all these, these legendary creatures, the five of them, they wanted Commander players to not only purchase, but brew for and play these cards. That's why they're legal. And no matter what anyone tells you, the legality of a card does impact a player's decision on not only one purchasing said card, but brewing for it. Legality does matter in this regard, and Wizards of the Coast knows that. That's what this response is. Um, there was no reason they should have made these silver bordered because they wanted the product to sell. And in regards to Secret Lair, as a whole, and it's been going on for more than just this year, but they're printing these cards like it's their only business. And in 2020, direct to consumer, that's kind of where it's at right now. If you don't know, there's a global pandemic happening. And WotC has almost nearly officially moved on to a direct to consumer market approach. And you know what? It's the 21st century. Every business does that. It is of no surprise that they're offering mechanically unique cards, in my opinion, via a direct to consumer approach because they can make a lot of money that way. That's what they're doing. It's a shame. It's a shame, but that's what's happening. And they price these cards based off the secondary market. What? And sometimes inflate the price over the secondary market because, you know, it's value added. I can make it foil. I can make it non-foil. I get special art. These things are really cool and they're really great for a select number of consumers, but availability on this end does suck for the people that live in regions that aren't going to be able to pick up these secret lair cards, especially if they like the walking dead. But it is of no surprise to me that they're doing this and you shouldn't be shocked that they're doing this direct to consumer marketing makes sense for them that is where the money is now why no godzilla why no godzilla and <laughs> this is in regards to the approach that they took with ikoria when they printed cards for the set and then they did mirror cards they don't call it that technically but essentially they had godzilla uh, themed cards based off of cards that were in the set. So they kind of do, but not in the way we did them in Ikoria. That exact execution wasn't a good fit for the product. Unlike the Godzilla cards that were distributed inside of booster packs along with the rest of Ikoria, the Walking Dead cards are sold by themselves. That meant we wanted them to maximize their appeal as a box set. Putting extra names on them was aesthetically unattractive. That said, we did build in a way to do backwards versions of the Godzilla skins. If needed, we can print a magic IP version of these cards with a magic name and creative concept art. We wanted to make sure that these cards were reprintable if needed. <laughs> if needed. What that means is if the product sells well, it's needed. They're gonna throw this in a box of something if these sell well. It, but the issue there is, and this is another availability issue, is it gonna be a topper uh, exclusive in a, if I buy a box of VIP boosters from this next set, do, do I get a chance at one out of 30 to see this particular card? It's likely not gonna be in a regular standard set of cards like what they did with Fetchlands, the Expeditions. It, it's absurd what they're doing with this product, but they know it sells and they will repeat doing this. Uh, so that's an entirely separate problem. The reprints, they're pulling a reverse Godzilla here, essentially. So they're stating that these cards can be reprinted, but uh, likely not, and likely not for a while. If needed, though. If needed, they will certainly reprint these cards, but the reverse Godzilla approach, not everyone's favorite thing. 
I think that if they did promise this in a set forthcoming like this year or the beginning of next year, that would have curbed some of this anger towards this product. But because that hasn't been the case, well, it's a major issue. And I agree with folks on this regard. It, it's a little annoying. We don't know when we're going to see these again, if we're going to see these again, how we're going to see them. And uh, that's a little messed up. But uh, one of the other issues, and this is in regards to the IP, the intellectual property of The Walking Dead being canon in Magic the Gathering. It's not. But why now canon? Why now canon? No, they are not. The frames and triangle watermarks specifically denote that they are not canon in the Magic universe. I will note that there are other cards with black borders from the alternate reality of Planar Chaos that are also not canon. Now what Mara is saying there is that they're not canon, okay? They're, of course they're not canon. You see a little triangle at the bottom? Oh, this isn't a gang symbol. That little triangle at the bottom denotes that they're not canon, all right? Now it's not the little oval that you're used to seeing as a watermark. It's a triangle. Now why anyone would think that these cards are canon in the MTG universe is beyond me, just because they're printed and they're legal for people to buy and play with, uh, doesn't mean that they were trying to make these canon. It was not decided that they would ever do that. And I don't know why. So I hope those fears are abated. Michonne, she is not a part of the MTG universe, no matter how much you wanted her to be. And this is the perfect way to segue into the cards themselves. I actually have them on the screen now. We're gonna discuss all of them from the viewpoint of a CDH player. Uh, but not only that, I can give you my thoughts from a commander perspective in general, whether these cards are good value, whether you should pick this up or not, and what list you might play them in. How about that? We'll just extend this promise even further. But Michonne, ruthless survivor. Now do note that the art depicts the characters from the filmic version, like the TV version of these characters. It's not from the comics, which if I'm not mistaken is still going on. I don't know. I don't read the comics, nor have I continued watching the show. But Michonne, Ruthless Survivor, is three generic, one black, and one green. For a legendary creature, Human Warrior, three three body, when Michonne enters the battlefield, create two walker tokens, and those are her brothers. Those zombies behind her are her brothers. Think about that. If I'm not mistaken, I remember when she entered the screen, she was so badass, and then they just like cut the badassery of her character down so much later on. One of the reasons I stopped watching the show. As long as Michonne is equipped, she must be blocked if able. And whenever Michonne and at least two zombies attack, she gains indestructible until the end of turn. That's cute. It's really committing you to a lot here. And the walkers are basically zombies. So if it says walker, think 2-2 two, two body. So for five mana, you produce 7-7 seven, seven worth of bodies. Is this card good? You can force blocks. That's something, I guess. You do need to commit a piece of equipment to the board as well. I don't think that's a big enough payoff to say that she's an equipment matters list in Golgari. Whenever Michonne and at least two zombies attack, she gains indestructible. You know, are there better things to do with indestructible? She's not gonna be equipping World Slayer and just ending the game, right? World Slayer should be on the screen now, but basically when you attack or deal damage with someone with World Slayer, you just destroy every permanent. There's nothing fun like that for Michonne here. She's not very good. She's not very good is what I'm getting at. And I'll try to go over these in the order that they were announced. I believe Negan was next. Negan, the cold-blooded. That gives it away. Uh, two generic, one red, one white, and one black. For you uh, Mardu players, look at you. Getting a new card. Legendary creature, human rogue. Fulfills the party requirement. 4-3 body. When Negan enters the battlefield, you and target opponent each secretly choose a creature that player controls. Then those choices are revealed and that player sacrifices those creatures. Whenever an opponent sacrifices a creature, you create a treasure token. Um, so I guess that's on theme. I've only seen a few scenes with Negan. I researched a little bit before doing this video. One, how to pronounce his name. Two, why he's relevant to the show. Three, why he's such a bad person. What's funny is one of the girls that's in his harem I went to high school with, blew my mind. I'm like, do I, do I know this girl? I don't condemn her for being in the show. I don't condemn anyone for watching the show. Um, but the card itself, it's fine. You have the chance to kill two creatures a singular opponent controls as he enters the battlefield. Right, so it's a mind game. You, you're like, 
oh, is he going to pick my commander? Oh, God, I should just say my commander so that I don't lose more than one thing. And then he picks your dork, right? So then you lose the fine horn elf and you lose your Ashaya. Fine, whatever. Ashaya. And he makes two treasures. It's not good. Uh, Negan's not good. He... Whenever an opponent sacrifices a creature, look, you can do more with that, obviously, right? So the idea here being you would build a list centered around giving your opponent's creatures and using clasms to destroy said creatures, make treasure, and ramp into some big thing. That is a lot of effort to do nothing but generate mana. So unless you happen to be top decking into said solution, Negan himself is not an outlet. This is not an impressive card. However, the next one... Now, I had to talk to someone on Twitter about this uh, because I was confused. Glenn, the voice of calm. For one generic, one white, and one blue. So you're in Azorius, legendary creature, human advisor, one three body, skulk. This creature can't be blocked by creatures with greater power. Now, the response I got was something along the lines that when, when skulk was a card, it was traditionally Demir. It's only on Demir creatures. That is black blue um, but they wanted to give glenn an effect that made him relatively unblockable right so he can't be blocked by creatures with greater power he only has one power so he's going to be relatively unblockable but skulk is a demir word avoid the word avoid just avoid the word why use skulk on a creature that makes no sense and he's certainly not white in his casting he's not a white identity creature for this next effect, whenever Glenn deals combat damage to a player, draw cards equal to his power? What? White has done power manipulation uh, for other reasons, right? Like you can make your opponent kill a creature with X power. Am I bullshitting you there? There are things where they've manipulated power to some effect, but never drawing cards. This is like, this is not white at all. What, what I'm saying is Glenn is not a white card. Why this is Azorius makes no sense to me. So that qualm aside, my personal complaint aside, is Glenn the Voice of Calm a good card? Yes! You don't really have great combat tricks in Azorius to buff him, right? So the idea being you would want... You would attack. You would get past the thing, right? So declare blocker step happens. Uh, damage. Trigger on the stack. Whenever Glenn deals combat damage to a player, draw cards equal to his power. Well, his power isn't determined yet. You can cast a spell to buff him, draw multiple cards at that occasion. Is this good? Yes, but Azorius really doesn't have the support for that. However, a draw engine like that at 3 CMC and a great color for control, like the amount of stacks you get from white, the amount of stupid counter spells you get from blue, the only color with viable counter spells, the best interaction in the game. Yeah, Glenn is going to be good. Glenn is the best of these commanders, potential commanders. And and, and by the way, this is illegal in all eternal formats. I think the only one that might be used is Rick, Steadfast Leader. The rest of these are just not good. I don't. I can't rightly speak for any other format, but Rick is the only one that looks like he would go into a human's deck or, or something of the sort. We're not talking about Rick yet, because we're talking about Daryl, Hunter of Walkers. Gruel, you know I love Gruel. Maybe you don't. I love Gruel. Two generic red green. Legendary creature human archer. 4-4 four, four body. Interestingly lacking reach. But he's an archer. At the beginning of your upkeep, target opponent creates three walker tokens. Tap it. Daryl deals two damage to target creature. Whenever a zombie opponent controls dies, draw a card. Requires a little bit more effort than Glenn, but the payoff is pretty extreme. Remember, walkers are 2-2 two, two zombies. And if you happen to run Clasms, you can just destroy the board. Now, a zombie has to die. It can't just be any creature, unfortunately. So it's not as relevant as Negan's ability. And Negan being in Mardu, you have a lot of, you know, each player sacrifices a creature kind of effect. Daryl, not as flexible, but you are creating the walkers. So imagine a Pyroclasm for two mana, and you kill all the dorks, you kill all the little shits, and then you happen to kill three walkers on top of that. For wiping the board, you just drew three cards at two mana. That is really good. Two mana draw three is really good just by itself. But that is how this deck is designed, right? And then maybe you'd go in there, tap Daryl, not for two damage to target creature, but you can uh, swing for four. 
I think casually this is going to be a powerhouse. In CDH, I think you're going to need to put a little bit more effort in to get the most out of Daryl. Again, I still think Glenn is the best just on paper. He's the easiest to accomplish the task with. Drawing one card, not amazing, but you can get him out earlier. You're going to have a lot of relevant stacks pieces. He's got Skulk for some reason. You're going to get in there. You're going to get in there. He's good. Uh, and the last one I want to talk about is Rick Steadfast Leader. This is the last one spoiled? No, by no means does it mean it is the last card for the set. They haven't officially announced how many cards are going to be in the set. I guess we'll find out with the Talking Dead if there's a sixth card. But Rick Steadfast Leader for two generic double white legendary creature human soldier 3-4 body. As Rick enters the battlefield, choose two abilities from among First Strike, Vigilance, and Lifelink. Pretty good. Humans you control have each of the chosen abilities, and he is a human himself, so he gets all of those abilities. As long as you control four or more humans, humans you control get plus two, plus two. Woo! That seems like a good finisher, right? If I was doing Constructed in a different format, but I'm not. As a commander, eh. eh super, uh, look, there is lots of humans you can choose from. If you play casually, not critiquing you, Rick is probably a really great commander for you. You definitely want to include him. I think he'll probably be fantastic as a commander in a casual deck. However, in CDH, we usually look for outlets in the command zone and or draw in the command zone, right? That's usually what hits the top tier, the upper crust. We want that kind of value. But this is really good at smashing face, and I think he's a really cool design um, <laughs> as a part of this set. It would be great, I'm sure, for people to see this in regular sets, but who the hell knows when that's going to happen, right? But those are the five cards from The Walking Dead uh, that have been announced up until this point. Now, to my audience members that are fans of The Walking Dead, do you find that these cards match mechanically the characters chosen? Do you feel like these are good representations of the characters that we see on AMC's The Walking Dead? I'm curious to know your opinions about these cards just from a thematic standpoint. But otherwise, how about you guys? Do you think you'll be using any of these cards? Do you imagine you'll be playing Michonne anytime soon? And or Daryl? Daryl, it's Daryl and Glenn seem the best for a commander, right? Draw is really good. The two draw commanders are obviously the most interesting ones. But I'd love to know if you guys are brewing for any of these lists. Uh, and I'll probably be brewing for one of them and adding that to Channel Fireball as a video. So if you don't know and you don't follow Channel Fireball, I also produce content for them. So I'll probably do something for one of these two over there. We'll see which one. But guys, some closing thoughts on the product. I think the most important thing to note here is that this is potentially good for the game, the life of the game. You're supporting the company that makes this product, and no matter how much people talk about this, this game is dead to them, they're putting down the game, uh, this will encourage more people that aren't familiar with the property to jump on board. Like, kids that watch AMC's Walking Dead and they want to play Michonne and they want to play Glenn now have a deck for them. And if they sit down at my table, I'm not going to shoo them away because they're playing something that I dislike. Again, tolerance is key here, and please keep an open mind when it comes to future products like this. Like, the emotional outburst was just too much. I understand the implementations this has on the game, but really, the major qualms I have are with availability and how they are marketing this product solely for Secret Lair. It would be nice if it was attached to a set. It would be nice if it was the Godzilla-esque approach, not the reverse Godzilla we're seeing here. Because when Maro says, if needed, at the end of a statement in regarding to reprints, it just sounds like bullshit. And it probably is. But remember, Wizards of the Coast, they're not your friend. They are a business, okay? But tolerance towards your friends, supporting the company they love, getting a product they enjoy, tolerance is key here. Try to maintain that in an open mind and moving forward, I think we'll be able to get over these secret lair humps, all right? Those are my thoughts. Now guys, if you want to help support the channel directly, you know it already. I said it off the bat. The best way to do so is by joining the Patreon. And again, there are member benefits, all of which are stated on there. But for my Brew Crew members, a special thanks to you guys for supporting the channel that little bit extra. And of course, we have the monthly topic to discuss. And regarding the monthly topic for October, what keyword do you want to return to MTGNY? We'll hear from Brew Crew member Adam.
Hi Internet, this is Adam. I'd like to say, splice down to Arcane and Banding, obviously. But seriously, two mechanics I wouldn't mind seeing a bit more prevalence are Walk and a Revamped Emerge. The former gives limited hosing, but allows for creature pressure strategies on otherwise stalemated boards without general unblockable, which allows for a little counterplay without resorting to sweepers. I think a revamped emerge could lead to some interesting ways to use your creature base as a resource, trading some security for a risky play. Simply docking of one mana I think is a little bit meh, but adding a caveat of non-token and dropping more off the cast could be interesting. Reminds me a bit of Breathstealer's alt casting of Spirit of the Night from Mirage. And as a bonus, modular abilities like riot thank you for joining me on another episode of the 99 stay tuned for more deck techs topicals and brew wars of course again my name is patrick marlette and happy brewing babies